Hello, this is Mark Holmes, the Editorial Director of VIA Satellite. We have another of our Thursday morning conversations, and this time we're going to Germantown in Maryland to talk to Pradman Call, the, the CEO of Hughes. So uh, firstly, a, a big hello, Pradman, and, and how are things going with you right now? Hi, Mark. Good to talk to you this morning. Uh, yeah, things, uh, we've been fortunate. We're obviously fighting with all the problems that everybody else is fighting, that COVID has... Uh, brought on us, but uh, all in all, we can't complain. We're uh, having good weather, hot, <laughs> but, uh, but it's also uh, from a business perspective, I think we're doing fine. It, it's good to hear. The weather is very hot here. Well, hot by UK standards anyway, probably not hot by Germantown, Maryland standards, but uh, glad to hear all is well. I mean, with these th with these conversations, what we like to do is we, we like to t ask some questions about music, movies, interests outside of satellites. So over the last few months, spending more time at home, anything, any movies or dramas you've been watching that you would recommend uh, that you've particularly enjoyed? You know, one of the interesting things uh, these days in uh, TV, at least, is these, the ability to actually just watch 30 episodes in one day and, <laughs> and catch all, all of them. So, you know, with the Netflix and uh, Prime and some of these things where you can watch just one show after the other, it's been very interesting. You know, some of the things that we watched uh, in the last four or five months is Breaking Bad, which is one of the best uh, shows I think that I've seen. And it's one of those that you just kept going all night and not, not going to sleep. So how many episodes did you watch in one night? I think I watched all of them, 56 or something like that. Uh, so back to back. You could stop. <laughs> you could stop. And recently we watched The Crown, which you, you, you should find of interest, obviously. Uh, and that was nice. It was less intense, than, yeah. uh, but but still very interesting. And because you you have be lived in that era, so the events that uh, you know were being discussed or shown clearly was something you had read about in the newspapers or you'd grown up with. And uh, so. Yeah. You, you, you're very much your your family very much like binge watching. You get one series and you decide, right, we're just going to crack on through this. Yeah, until we, you, know, you find there's so much stuff on TV that's of no interest. Mm -hmm. Very, but so something like these, uh, they they address the issues in depth, and they if they can grip you in two or three episodes, then it's great, right? It's not, yeah. uh, so we enjoy that, yes. Absolutely. Fantastic. Do you have like a favorite movie at all or something when you're not watching like 20 episodes of Breaking Bad back to back? Do you have a favorite movie? A lot of, a lot of movies have been really good. I mean, from, but I, I'd be showing my age if I told you which movies I really enjoyed. But yeah, yeah. I, mean, I love, I mean, I go to movies for entertainment, mm -hmm. not for uh, intellectual satisfaction. Yeah. And, uh, you know, things like old movies of Hitchcock are, are obviously of interest. And then in today's world, you see uh, uh, more light movies. Uh, but uh, once you go to a movie, you just go. And I usually doze off after, <laughs> <laughs> after an hour or so. But uh, but we, we haven't been able to go see a movie, right, in a theater. You don't get the popcorn and you don't get the... the the rest of the entertainment. So what was the last movie you went to at a theatre? You know, it's probably sometime in February and uh, January, January or February of this year, just yeah. before the, and I can't, I couldn't tell you which one it was. <laughs> but if it comes back, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll speak up. No, that's good to know. Are, are you a music fan at all? Any particular sorts of music that you yeah, like? Yeah, I've, I've been a music fan for a long time, obviously since I was a little kid. Yeah. And, uh, you know, started off with a lot of it, uh, jazz and big band in the, remember, I'm, my, I'll tell you my age later, but, but uh, in the 50s, when I was 10, 11 years old, uh, late 50s, it, it was really great to hear uh, the big bands and the jazz uh, 
And I've remained a jazz and big band fan. In fact, I was just thinking about it as I drove into work this morning. And the, cha the XM channel that I had tuned into was the 40s, uh, which, which had, you know, and they had Gene Krupa, who was one of my favorite drummers. And then uh, obviously Count Basie and Lionel Hampton. And so you really enjoy, those are fantastic music, you know, and you can hear it then and you can hear it today. And it's still of great interest. Then as I grew up, Elvis was a big deal in, in, in the, around 1960. And then we went on to rock and roll and Chuck Berry. And there was a British singer, I don't know whether you know him, around that time who was a favorite. I grew up in India, by the way. Yeah. Uh, was uh, uh, Cliff Richard. Oh, yeah. Everyone in the UK knows Cliff Richard. Yeah, I, nobody here knew him when I came here. I said, hey, do you guys listen to Cliff Richard? Nah, who's Cliff Richard? But that that is that is interesting. And then, uh, then of course, the Beatles came and that, that era came. And then I went to California for uh, my graduate work. And there we got into all the, the late 60s into people like The Doors and Earth, Wind and Fire. And, and, you know, and after that, you go into the 80s and, uh, and you know, and I, I, I can't tell you that I'm really infatuated with the music since then. I still go back and listen to Light My Fire of The Doors and The Beatles and The Rolling Stones and, uh, and, and that era and then the jazz and big band games and then I'm obviously still uh, have a lot of interest in Indian music, yeah. both uh, both classical and uh, and pop. So a lot of music. And I love having XM radio in my car, so whenever I'm driving, I can listen to anything from the '40s to today's world. Do you have like a favorite gig or concert that you went to? Something that you look back on and you yeah, think? Absolutely, oh, there, there are probably two that have been. It just stuck in my head. One was uh, Harry Belafonte mm -hmm. his, in, in his Calypso's late 60s kind of time frame. Just He was a great showman, you know, and he is a great showman. And then a lot uh, in the jazz area with like one that, that comes to mind is Stan Getz and uh, with the Bossa Nova from Brazil with Alberto, jo uh, jo Antonio Carlos Jovim and Astrid Gilberto, the, those, those three were just fabulous musicians <laughs> and is a great there, concert. Is there much of a jazz, I mean, in Washington, Maryland, um, is there much of a, a jazz scene there where you can go to a, um, you know, a, a music scene there where there's quite really regular? Yeah, there, there, you know, again, pre-COVID, there, there are probably two or three places which are very famous and have been here forever. Yeah. You know, typical smoke-filled rooms with the uh, dark, uh, and there's one called Blues Alley in Georgetown, okay. which, which which has you know always gets the top. You know, unfortunately, even though the you know, jazz was invented in the U.S., uh, it hasn't really done well in the U.S. anymore. You know, after the '50s, yeah. I mean, when you listen to an Ella Fitzgerald or something. What a voice! And uh, you can you never be able to see a concert by people like them, of course. But uh, but there is a hardcore fan base in the in, in the U.S. And there's another club called the 930 Club in D.C. I guess these are the two biggest uh, clubs. But they're not very huge. They get probably 150 people or or something. But they get all the top artists. And uh, so it's, it's it's enjoyable, and then we go to New York quite often, and go to the Village, and you catch the two or three famous, uh, you know, jazz clubs there. And um, before we get we good for jazz clubs, right? In England, oh yeah, but in London, Money Scots. Yeah, I always try to go there when I go to London, <laughs> and then in Paris there are a couple of really old great jazz clubs and Rome has one or two. 
you're making me want to go to a jazz club now um <laughs> talking about it, which, is, uh, which is a lot of fun um before we get on to some some work stuff do you have any sort of interests outside of satellite i mean obviously we have more time at home more time with our families um what, what are sort of your sort of yeah, i mean i i love sports and uh I, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time watching sports, you know, whether it's uh, NFL football or cricket or uh, soccer, uh, you know, it's it's uh, basketball, tennis. So I spend probably more time watching sports than I should. I, 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 I won't talk, we could talk probably sports for the next hour, but I won't do that. Do you have any particular teams that you follow in, in NFL and, and soccer? Yeah, in, uh, you know, clearly in Washington, uh, the Washington, we can't say the Redskins anymore, it's the Washington team. The name has been uh, deleted from all correspondence, and that's a separate story by itself. But uh, yeah, the Washington home team in football is. Uh, clearly been something that I've followed since I came to the United States 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and that's, where, you know, and then when I was at California for a while, we followed the 49ers, the San Francisco. So those are my, you know, favorite teams. We live and die with them, uh, like in every sport local fans do. Cricket, obviously, I follow the Indian team a lot. They're doing good these days. I guess you guys, uh, did well uh, uh, year, last couple of days ago when you beat Pakistan, right? It was a really good test. I still love test cricket. I mean, I love 2020, but you can't beat a good uh, test match. No. Test match. It's just yeah, the yeah. Do, you, do you have a soccer team at all? Do you follow? You know, a long time ago when I was growing up in India, the team I followed in the Premier League was Manchester United. And uh, because of that, it stuck with even though you don't necessarily get it, although now we're beginning to see more and more soccer on the, uh, but Manchester United has stayed as one of my my favorite team for a long, long time. Excellent. Well, uh, let, let's talk a little bit. I, I won't mention I'm a Liverpool supporter. Uh, um, <laughs> that's, uh, um, obviously a good year for me, but, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit. Um, I'm always intrigued whenever I talk to anyone in these conversations about how things have changed for you in terms of managing Hughes and, and you know, it's been an unprecedented era, I think, for all of us. Um, how, how has it been for you and, you know, managing Hughes during this time and uh, sort of your observation of, the, of this period? Yeah, it's a tough, uh, tough period uh, because of the, uh, you know, it's very difficult to have a, a experience from a similar situation and therefore get some guidance on how to manage different events as they occur yeah uh on the good side is is uh, it's uh, you know the market that we are in which is primarily internet access has remained very strong so we've not had to struggle to uh, grow a little bit and make a reasonable profit and uh, so financially the company has done well you know, we just had our earnings call last week, and you, you know, and the numbers look, were good when you compare it to previous uh, periods and previous years. So that has been uh, a good surprise. Uh, we when we when we started off in March in this thing, we all said, "Oh my God, what's going to happen? It's going to be doomsday," you know. And uh, but that's been good. The uh, the part that's more challenging is understanding all the problems that the employees have because of the you know things like how do they if the husband and wife both work and how what happens for child care you know the 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 daycare centers are shut down uh, so a lot of human real human problems yeah uh, have to be addressed and there's always that uh, trade off between what what is right from a company perspective to what's right for the employee perspective and managing that is is the biggest challenge you know that we have every day and how how difficult has that been for you i mean to, you it's know it's been very difficult because you get into uh, 
things that you say as a CEO of a company and you, your objective is to maximize shareholder, shareholder return, you know, can you do that and not compromise on what's best for the employee who's got his own or her own uh, problems, right? And somehow the two don't uh, converge to the same solution. Uh, but we have, you know, navigated our way through through that. We we talk to a lot of people. We have groups that uh, advise uh, us as to what the employees are thinking. And uh, but it, it's probably the most difficult part is drawing, uh, skirting that middle line uh, in there. I mean. Back in back in March, when this was really sort of starting to break, and uh, and we were all, all all seeing that our lives were going to change, did did you sort of envisage that it, it was going to have the dramatic changes that that we've actually seen happen? I mean, what what would your I'm, I'm just curious in terms of your sort of thinking, you know, sort of back then, um, you know, and whether you sort of what your mindset was as we were going into this period. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, for for example, I remember a meeting of the management on March, around March 15th. And we saw this was coming and we said, OK, let's take the following action for two weeks. We should be OK by March 27th. That, that date sticks in my mind. So we thought it was going to be a two week phenomena. So we told people, go home, take care of your family, uh, you know, and uh, come back to work on March 27th. and everything is going to be okay. So that gives you a feeling of how accurate we were. <laughs> and, and obviously we're sitting here today and we just put out something to the employees that said, uh, you know, we're going to give you 30 day notice whenever we want you back in the building, but uh, it won't be any earlier than sometime in September or October. So that's a long time, right? And uh, so, so it basically tells you there's no way to predict what's going to happen. So you're managing a company like ours, which is what a two billion dollar company, and with uh, two thousand employees all over the world. You're you're managing them with no 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 way to say this is what will happen thirty days from now, sixty days from now even 90 days from now, we don't know. So, uh, you know, we have we got to figure our way out. But our employees have responded very, very nicely. Uh, you know, they, we have the, obviously everybody, we expect them to work from home. We don't want to take people's paychecks away. So everybody is, is working from home. The efficiencies are, seem to be very good if you look at the results of uh, the, how many units are manufactured or how much code is written or how much uh, what the development is the results seem to be good it's obviously some places it's really good some places close to being good but all in all the i think uh, we're very pleased with the way people have motivated themselves and the challenge is how long can this go on you know if somebody could tell me two months from now everything's cool I could solve the problem very easily of what we do. It's not that so straightforward. But overall, I think it's done very well. I I was making, uh, going on to another topic I wanted to address today, I was making a joke. I, I went on, a, I had some vacation days um, a, a few days ago, and I said, knowing my luck, there'll be a big one web story that breaks on the Monday that I go away <laughs> on vacation. And I didn't, you know, I, I'm not sort of bright enough that I predicted that this actual happened. And then, of course, I saw the uh, announcement and we've been all over the OneWeb story this year. Um, I'm just sort of curious in terms of the background, really, in terms of when did when when did OneWeb become like a, a serious option for Hughes that you thought, OK, this is we, we want to do this. Can, you know, maybe just tell us a little bit about how. Yeah. How this, this, this was obviously many years ago, ago you know, it was, I think it was three years or four years uh, ago. The, there was a guy called Greg Weiler, who was, uh, who was really the founder of OneWeb, or the guy who originated yeah. the idea. And uh, I didn't know Greg before 
this event occurred four years ago, five, three years ago, so something. Well, I ran into him at one of these conferences, and you know, and uh, and he made his pitch. He was looking for money, obviously, and uh, uh, you know, he's always, Greg is a is a very powerful uh, generator of ideas and transmitting those ideas uh, to to you and. Uh, uh, you know, we knew we had to get in some way into the Leo Mio world, because clearly we're we're providing uh, internet access and other uh, data networking services or managed network services via satellite. We've always been leaders for the last 30 years. Always had uh, you know more than 50% market share in this area. So we had to have a play with Leos and Mios to handle the applications where uh, latency is an issue and uh, total global coverage is an issue. And he, you know, we, we got excited, excited by the idea. So we certainly wanted to be in the business of developing technology for them and developing their systems. And then in order to uh, make that happen, uh, Greg, uh, gave us a pitch to invest the money in it too, which we did. And and then we we became one of the technical partners and we built all the uh, gateways uh, and had helped in the system design along with Qualcomm, which is the other major tech technology player. And that's how we did. And then we've, we've ridden that roller coaster over the last three, four years with them. What about the latest one? I mean, the latest, you know, going with like Barty and the UK government. What, what, when I was, what the background in terms of accelerating? Yeah, you know, the, obviously OneWeb was going at that stage through the bankruptcy courts and uh, were, uh, were going to uh, the bankruptcy court. I think that there was this date of the end of last month. Uh, or some, some and it took a month or two ago. And I, I've known uh, Sunil Mittal from Bharti for, for my 20, 30 years. And, uh, but that didn't have anything to do with it. One day I get a phone call from a gentleman who says he's uh, so-and-so in the prime minister's office. Okay. Uh, and they would like to talk to us uh, about potentially, uh, uh, helping in building this new one web uh, first i thought you know that he was it was a prank <laughs> but i don't think it, it it obviously wasn't and then i talked to some other person from the prime minister's office also who was uh, more of an investment uh, banker kind of guy and then two days later sunil calls me and he says hey president how are you doing so i said what, what's happening and I didn't know till then that he was involved. So he told me the story and said, "Could would would we, would we be a technology partner with with them? You know, and we we worked, we negotiated an agreement, at least a tentative agreement. We haven't sealed it yet. Uh, that uh, that that had us playing a role as a technology partner and a potential investor." And that's it. And so we're moving very quickly with them. We're figuring out, uh, you know, how we work from here onwards. That, that is such a terrible story. It happened in days. I love the fact that you thought it may have been a prank, and like someone from the UK government just uh, um, sort of called you up and uh, stuff. Um, we're almost out of time. I'm going to end on a. I'm going to end on a sports question because I know you're a sports fan, and right. uh, one of the sports that you and I have in common, which I guess a lot of our uh, American friends don't, is, is cricket. So I'm going to ask you, who is your favourite um, Indian cricketer who you've most enjoyed watching down the years? Sachin Tendulkar. I had a feeling it might have been Sachin, the greatest batsman. You know. One of the three, four greatest batsmen of all time. He is fantastic. I remember watching him when he was about 17 years old at a test match in the UK. And exactly. I couldn't believe someone that young was that good. It was just, it was like batting in slow motion. He was seeing the ball so much 
It was just incredible. No, I mean, if, and anyway, every record in cricket, he owns it. He does. Fantastic player. I think that's a great, I mean, what a way to, to end a conversation. A prank call from the UK Prime Minister's office and talking cricket. That's why we love these Thursday morning conversations. So, Pradman, um, firstly, um, thank you for your time today. Um, you know, as you know, via satellite, we're a big fan of Hughes. So we wish you, your team and everybody um, safe, safe health, obviously, first and foremost. But we also wish wish you a successful uh, rest of the year and going into into uh, 2021. You know, we're uh, you know, we want the community to do well and uh, bring connectivity and bring great services to communities across the world so uh, we wish you all the best and we uh, look forward to uh, seeing you soon thanks mark uh, you know i enjoyed this half hour uh, you're doing a great job with these things you know it's really interesting to hear the other folks uh, and hear their stories and i think it's fun thanks for doing it Really, it's absolutely our pleasure, and we look forward to uh, catching catching up either at Satellite or at a Jazz Club soon. <laughs> Sounds good. Ronnie Scott. Ronnie Scott, there we go. All right, thank you. Thanks, Robin.